ladies and gentlemen, welcome back and welcome to the panel session part of the program. So this is security education panel on behalf of IFIP Working Group at Edwin Point 8. So that's the security education working group within Technical Committee 11. We have here a panel of experts to answer some questions that I will pose based on some, some points raised by uh, Colonel Ron Dodge, the chair of Working Group at Edwin Point 8 plus some additional points that I'm throwing in as well. What we're going to do is to explore three key themes, starting with security education in the academic context, so from the university perspective initially, then moving on to consider the organisational context, so the need for security education and awareness for people within the workplace, and then wider again to consider the more general population and security awareness in everyday life. Okay, so I will pose questions to the panel, but do feel free to, to jump in with additional points that you'd like to raise in response to the things that they might say. But let's begin by just running across the panel and letting each of them introduce themselves and their particular perspective on the issue of security education. So we start at the far end with Gerdrix. Okay, uh, I'm Wood McGillan, I'm a professor of information security at Virginia Commonwealth the University of Michigan, Virginia. Uh, I have been in the field of security for a couple of decades now, I guess. Uh, I run the, uh, uh, a very unique program at Virginia uh, of the University, which is a combined uh, information systems, a business school and engineering school master's program, so it's like half and half. So, which is an interesting way to be with security. Now, I'm Patterson. I'm currently a, a visiting research fellow at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. Uh, I have been teaching prior to this role for 20 years in another university and security, about 15 years of security, even including forensics, would you believe? Um, so I've stopped the teaching thing and I'm just concentrating on research in the area, specifically human issues in information security, or now called cyber security. Uh, it's interesting for you to know that I'm now in a business school and of course we'll just discuss this today I guess as to where we belong maybe uh, as to where we come from a computer science school where I was for five or more years and now in a business school. Um, I think that's often relevant to some of these questions that we might raise. I'm Ian Clark from Plymouth University. Um, I'm a member of the TCM8 Wines, sorry, TCM8 Information Screen Management um, Working Group. Um, I'm also having a, I created and managed our undergraduate and master's programs in information security, and I still teach on them. And I've been doing so for the past 14 or 15 years. So a um, fair degree of experience in the area. Hi, I'm Ram Kirkenaidu from Kaspersky Lab. I'm an education manager, and what that means is I work with universities like Plymouth University to deliver um, what we think are the major issues in uh, security, information security, and we do challenges, we do competitions for students, and we try to engage and work collaboratively with universities around the world. Okay, thank you all. So the first question, as I say, the theme initially is around security education in the context of universities. And certainly something that I've observed with the increasing emphasis on cyber security and the funding that's being devoted towards that, there are an increasing number also of institutions that are now running security-themed programs. So an increasing number of both masters and undergraduate degree programs appearing with security within their title. Now, if you look at the syllabus for some of these programs, sometimes you detect that the actual security content may seem a little bit light. And I wondered if the panel had any views on this, and also whether, basically, any institution should be allowed to establish a security program in this context, or whether there is a need for some sort of accreditation of security-related programs to ensure that it's being done appropriately. So I don't know who'd like to jump in and answer that first. From an American perspective, you uh, might do. I think um, um, in the U.S., especially, uh, uh, some accreditation efforts were being made by uh, several bodies, particularly uh, uh, NSA, 
national security agency and then under all the day, several programs um, around the country. Uh, I believe they failed miserably because uh, we were trying to regulate uh, essentially a public university or a private university to, to behave in a certain way uh, by throwing some money at those universities. I don't, I don't think that works very well. Uh, at least from a North American perspective, let's say, it's, it's a market-driven thing. You know, if there's a market for security programs, people go to those security programs. And, and I think the market is pretty smart in terms of discerning which program, programs are good, which programs are bad. Um, my university, for example, uh, we do not have an attack security program, but a lot of people do get placed in security positions following their undergraduate degree. And that's largely because uh, I believe, and again, I'm, I said in the business school, uh, our program was the first program in the country to be accredited by both the business accrediting body and an engineering accrediting body. So we are AACSB accredited from the business side, but we are AVET accredited from the engineering side. So um, the idea being that we, we bring in both the technical component uh, and the business side in for undergraduate education. So I think that a lot of students benefit from that particular kind of emphasis, which is interesting. But when you go into the master's level, um, uh, I think, I, I, again, and, you know, I can speak of our own university, and it's been about four years. We were, although I have been at the university for over a decade now, but um, we were pretty slow in starting our master's program. We didn't, we should just didn't jump on the bandwagon and say, you know, because the market is there for the school program, we should do it. Um, so about four years ago, we finally launched our master's program, which I believe is a very, very unique program because it brings together an engineering component and a business component. So to be most masters, or 30 masters uh, in the US, which means about 10 courses. So we have five from computer science and five from information systems, which are security programs. Um, they, they are all designed for security. They, not be, they have not been flowered together just because of the security program. They're all security programs. Um, but again, you know, universities typically would probably invest a little bit of time and effort uh, in getting these programs off the ground. But after that, they have to be supported by the students. Uh, if they are not, then then we have to rationalize in some shape and form. So I think. Everything is good, but uh, you know, over regulation gives these programs as well to some extent. So I mean, that, that's that's been our experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there the other two academics on the panel, but particularly you? Um, I always uh, found that uh, in the Australian scene, anyway, there was the problem of there is no room in the program for something like X, Y, or Z. In the case, security. I mean. You know, we needed to teach knitting, for example. We needed to teach basket weaving. I mean, everything wanted to be in the program. To the, and, and I still think that might be the problem, even though the AACSB, which my business school is now accredited by, uh, they, they dictate as to what they must see in this program. I thought it was pretty good, actually. And I think that's one of the problems. So I don't think anybody within the AACSB knows much about the security, perhaps because it doesn't seem to be a requirement because my business school teaches nothing to do with security. We have no students to do with security. That, that's exactly the point. Um, I think when the creating bodies come and ask you to do certain things, there is no room. I mean, if, if we look at the graduate level, there's only so much we can do. There's absolutely no room for another class. Uh, so, and you can work with the things. I mean, in my university, you have one pure security class. Which is mm -hmm. Right. So there's only so much you can do uh, in that sense. I, I agree with you. I think you tie your hands, but, but I, I am kind of more for accreditation. I feel there is a, a need for a, a quality measure. And you know, the very fact that you're going through these accreditations, the, the, the engineering and the, the, the business, kind of gives some credibility to the idea that actually getting these, this, this recognition for your program is good. And I think security is becoming an age where actually getting a, a security specific accreditation is also would be useful. Then the question comes down to actually what are the criteria? 
how fixed are they? Because uh, as kind of the point we made a little bit earlier, we come at this problem from different directions. You guys are very much more from a business perspective. Um, ourselves will come at more from a computer science perspective. And I think any accreditation that needs to allow for that different perspectives rather than saying, here's your prescribed program, this is what your program must have. And what you end up having is, is 30 institutions all doing the same program because the, the accrediting body defines it to, to be very rigid. Um, so there's a bit of flexibility, I think, with the pedal. Yeah, I think, you know, I take your point. Um, I mean, there's something to be said about a granting body, but let me play a devil's advocate a little bit, you know. Um, I think accreditation occurs at different levels. When you talk about AACs, CSPs in the world, they are, in my mind, and I'll be very vocal about it, they are nothing more than a business money making machine. You know, they figure out a way of generating revenue by accrediting programs around the world. And now they have literally throwing out of their patients internationally. Um, I think what is more important is regional accreditation of universities. So every time around, you know, in, in our case, we have something called SHEV. SHEV is the local Virginia accrediting body. So every single degree program, accredited degree program, has to go through SHEV. Right? And I think that is a way more solid way of maintaining quality. In a program and, and also integrity within a given region. Now, and, and I can speak of Virginia, so we have several schools in Virginia, so in order to maintain the integrity of the programs, what is being offered in Northern Virginia or Charlottesville or Richmond or Willow Mary, whatever is being offered there has to be tightly integrated. ASCSP can't do that. You know, a regional integrity body can. So, so I think there is value of accreditation, but I'm more in favor of a regional one than some grandiose thing yeah. out there. But also, if there's <coughs> more security programs available and it's getting a higher profile, isn't that just generally a good thing to have? And then the accreditation comes afterwards, because from my perspective, the more students in business, economics, law, marketing, if they all have a security component in there, for me, that's a really good thing, raising the profile of it, and then get their accreditation afterwards, or should they both be at the same time? I think it depends, you know, I certainly agree with you, I think the kind of security in probably most computer science courses and probably other, other courses would be a very good idea. And, and increasingly, I think a lot of UK institutions need to recognise that and, and incorporate it. We certainly do, all of our students basically get sort of some content um, from the school perspective. I think the, the question of accreditation is, you know, we're all aware of it, there's a certain element of bandwagon jumping, so when particular um, phrases come out that are very popular, so cyber is very popular, you start seeing all these programmes popping up with cyber, in, and you look at their course content, and it really doesn't necessarily reflect what you'd expect to see. And that can be confusing for the applicant, can of course can be confusing for the organisation with the employed person. You know, if you're employing someone with a cyber security title, you'd expect them to do probably a set of core activities within that domain, which they may may not be able to do. Uh, and that's where I think accreditation could, could have a role, but as I said before, like, for me, it, it needs to be kept not to be too restrictive and too regulatory in, in what it defines. I have a question or a comment from the floor. Yeah, I, th I think one of the issues I think that, that we've got, and I'm not sure whether accreditation is, is right or wrong, because to be honest, we can get accredited by whoever we want, could be ECS or whatever, but you know, you know, it's good. Is it not just about giving confidence to prospective students or the students in the quality of the teaching that they're going to get? Because we can set up a, a degree program in, say, for example, ethical hacking, with people that have never pen tested or not even been involved in security, but they've been told by their boss that they've an ethical hacking course. I assume that all that sounds sexy, but the quality of teaching is not there. Um, and I think really, I suppose my, my point is, it's about trying to give confidence to students in the quality of teaching. And I don't know whether it's participation in research, um, because I don't think students get that. Um, I don't know whether it's accreditation, because accreditation can be quite prescript prescriptive. So, um, but I think it's just about giving that confidence to students in the quality and, and knowledge of the, the, the lecturers. And whether that's in network security or whether it's or whatever, you know, and because all the security courses are going to be different depending on the teacher. Thank you for bringing the portion of view to the discussion. Um, I'm the director of the Master of Information Systems in Portugal, and uh, we have uh, an accreditation body, a national accreditation body, of course, that we're talking about. Uh,
scale that is different from Porto, but that national accreditation body um, it receives all the proposals of uh, new degrees on the graduate way to graduate or PhD. And uh, there's a proposal, there's a panel that uh, is formed to uh, assess uh, not only the content but also faculty and the teaching methodologies and uh, evaluation. All this is uh, considered together, not only the content or not only the faculty, but all the, the, the offer. Uh, and uh, it may go up, uh, go up, it may proceed or not. Uh, so, and every three or five years, uh, the process repeats. Um, it is very important, for instance, in terms of information systems in Portugal, um, because the degree that I'm talking about is similar, because uh, we are in an engineering school, but we have the, the two facets, the engineering uh, formation plus the business formation. Um, and it is very important when we do the proposal, for instance, uh, to sustain, to support uh, our proposal, because it is a new course, for instance. And in that, uh, in that matter, uh, things like uh, IIS curriculum directives or ACM are very important. Of course, for something like uh, uh, a specific um, graduate or another course on uh, information security, uh, we won't find that something similar to that at level of an IIS or at level of ACM. Maybe I uh, can, can do something like that. Uh, I know that uh, Michael Whitman uh, has a curriculum conference and so on. Um, but those are also important criteria for decision uh, to the evaluator's panel to see how this aligns with international standards and international reference. So accreditation is not only look inside the country, but trying to, to see how does, does it fit in the in a world view, if you want. Okay. Good point. Yeah, so, so we just went through a BCS accreditation in the, in the British academics now and a few years. It was not a pleasant process. So two things. The first was that they um, came in and said, we want you to be information security at every level of undergraduates, which is kind of a surprise for us. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm the kind of person who always wants to do information security. Other people going, no, this is more important networks programming, you know. And so we've kind of been forced now to make sure that every single undergraduate does some information security course, which I think is a good thing. But the whole accreditation process was very painful for us. And what we wondered was whether the students actually care. You know, the students, to me, when I asked the students, they said, no, we, we have a degree from Glasgow University. That's what gets us the job. Not the fact that the BCS is accrediting us. And so I think accreditation bodies have the potential to become very bureaucratic very prescriptive, and if there are not enough industrial people involved, then you're getting things that academics think that we should be doing, but the students want to do the stuff with their jobs, potentially going to get them jobs. So, if you, I, so I, I'm worried about accreditation personally. Maybe I'm just, because I've just gone through the process and it was so awfully painful, I'm sort of, no, I don't want to do that anymore, but I, I'm not convinced that it helps the students. I think the caliber of the university is what says whether they get good teaching or not. Now, a comment you made about the BCS, for example, looking for security to yes. be present at several levels, it also picks up a couple of points that the panel made, and also the, one of the questions that Ron has posed about the emphasis that security receives within the wider computer science programs, for example. So your point that the BCS are actively looking for security to be present. Malcolm made the point that sometimes it's hard for security to find its way into a program because there's various other things that need to be included. So to what extent, and I'll pose this to the panel, to what extent do you feel security gets enough prominence, maybe as a topic for modules or courses or whatever the terminology is that's used, and indeed as a topic of emphasis within other subjects. So for example, within software engineering, perhaps the, the emphasis is very often on can we squeeze enough performance out of the software, and that's the direction where a lot of attention goes, perhaps at the expense of ensuring that it's implemented in a secure way. It's a multi-pronged response, you know, so, uh, I'll pick on what you're saying and I, I feel the pain. <laughs> and, and I'll pick on your point about pen testing and ethical hacking. I think, you know, if, if I were to graduate a student today, you know, uh, they'll probably have more chance of picking up a job in ethical hacking, right? So, does my program offer that course or that kind of training or education? Answer is no. Right? Uh, should I have it? Yes. 
how easy it is to put it in the program is extremely difficult. Right? So can we build flexibility around doing this? Yes. Do we have the great people to do this? No. And just carry on and on and on with it. Now, if BCS or some other very body comes around and says we need to have security in every single class or every single level. Every single year. Sorry? Every single year. Every single year. Yeah. Are there enough trained faculty out there to even do that? I mean, theoretically speaking, it makes sense to have it that I mean, we would all like security to be part of any curriculum. But we don't have a faculty. So, so at our database course, for example, I convinced the lecturer to, to include a lecture on database security, which was very good of him. And they said, no, that's not enough. I said, but that's how I can embed it. I, I can help the lecturer to just do one lecture so that the student gets a favor. And, and that, is, that is part of the problem of what we've experienced in, uh, in the U.S. from the National Security Agency when they went around to create all these programs. <laughs> so they want a three-year program where security gets embedded at the undergraduate level, and then they very good at the center of excellence or whatnot. The point is, if you're an engineering school or a business school, it doesn't really matter. They just don't want to be branded as a security program. Now, mm -hmm. let's let's not be security people. Let's be an administrator and say, you know, how am I going to market my BS in information technology management or whatever? I don't want to market it as a security. Matters. And I want it to be generic so that I want to attract a wider audience of students and they can be placed in all sorts of organizations. I don't want it to be security only. So I think by imposing those constraints from a, from a business model, it doesn't make sense to do that. So I think we need to have sufficient flexibility in these programs where you can get good enough and you can customize it for the students' liking and the market liking and respond appropriately as to whatever the demands are. I certainly think we need to be careful because the, the problem with BCS with point of view panels is quite often you, you do what needs to be done. So you put the modules in there, you really have staff to, to teach it, and you end up repurposing staff that maybe are experts in database and software engineering to, to the form of security. And, that, and that's not good because the student doesn't get a positive experience because of that lack of capability. Um, not just that lack of enthusiasm. You really want to deploy people where their passion is. Yes. That's the best teaching. Now, I don't know too much about the accreditation systems, but I don't, can't see them getting down to the level, John, of assessing the actual lecturer. I mean, yeah. No, not the lecturer, but they did ask us to provide lecture science, so they did go down quite deep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, me teaching forensics, I mean, I know nothing about forensics, really. I mean, that's, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we see you offering such a module now. Yeah. Sure <laughs> <not. Okay. laughs> One more question on the, on the specific theme of university education. Now, a couple of times already we've had the term ethical hacking mentioned, and that's something certainly where we're seeing programs, if not underlying modules, appearing with that term in title. So what did the panel think about the value and wisdom of teaching offensive security techniques, those that uh, could be potentially misused as part of the academic programs? They're already being done, so you know. So, <laughs> uh, the, the several, at least uh, in the United States, there are several universities and programs which, which do teach interesting um, ethical hacking. So they, they're already there. I think um, I think we move beyond uh, a philosophical discussion of whether we should be defensive or offensive in terms of teaching techniques and all that stuff. But I think it's already being done, so it's part of the norm. And should it at least be accompanied by a solid background in ethical practice, for example, to that's ensure that any program offering that is actually emphasizing that ethical aspect of the work? That, that's a good point, Steve. I think, I, you know, personally, and, and, and I might be a minority here, but I say that, but I personally believe that there is a difference between education and uh, training. Mm -hmm. And I think when we teach techniques, uh, you're essentially uh, ready. You know, and I don't, I don't think that's the role of the university. I think that's more vocational in a sense. So I think universities should be more at a principal's level of education. Um, but unfortunately, over the years, we have confused the two terms of vocation, vocational training versus education. 
and they kind of mix together. Um, much to my personal dislike, I'm going to the floor myself, and there's so much more person can do. But that's my philosophy. So I think when you talk about principles, I think ethical principles and, and so on and so forth, absolutely. Um, but I think I think that's where education is, you know, and training is on the other side. But then some of my colleagues who do a lot of that the problem on like that's it. So <laughs> here's, here's my point. If you were to survey all the hackers in the world, how many of them would have had any courses or training? I mean, very few of them, because they pick it up readily, they've got a passion for how computers work, although they don't tend to know so much how computers work. They've got you to some, some extent, don't they? But um, uh, they're trial and error, I suppose. But, um, I think my concern with the idea is that I think you always get a uh, step of offensive in order to know better how to set your networks. That's kind of the argument why we always give but why we do that in practice. It, it's the proportion of that offensive activity within the program that can be slightly concerning. And also, for me, particularly recently, it's the way the media present a lot of these hacking cases. So you've got governments now actively, offensively attacking other countries. And it almost seems okay to do so. And that's where I think you know, the comment about the strong ethical aspect in the program should be made aware that this, this stuff is completely illegal and you shouldn't be doing that in, in, in kind of the outside world. And that, I think, can be lost quite easily when you're drilling the students day in, day out with, with all the hacking techniques and the technology they can use. From my perspective, coming from a security company that are, is interested in securing and defending our customers, uh, you have to be very careful when you're talking about ethical hacking. For me, it's an oxymoron. You can't have ethical hacking. Um, if you're talking about vulnerability testing and penetration testing and doing it within a scope of a project that you're doing with a company or a university, and you have um, scoped out the project and everything else. That's one thing. If you're telling people, okay, these are the techniques that hackers do for, for example, they're going to do like a DDoS distributed denial of service or something else like that, then that's completely different. To do, do an analogy in for the offline crime, as you would say, for someone, d does a policeman need to know how to break into a car? to know that it's the wrong thing to do and maybe to know the techniques, how they use it that I either use a crowbar or a thing to get in but they don't actually have to go in and do it themselves to, be, to know to know. There's a kind of a fine line there and it's the same in, in security I think you can teach them, these are the kind of techniques but don't get them to have a test and for them to actually practice it out That's for me, unethical, to have an appreciation of it. And from my experience from uh, the, the bad guys that we're researching, they know how to break into systems, but when then they are trying to fix things, um, like um, bug testing for, uh, for their, their software, they're, they're very bad things. It's much more difficult to um, do the defensive side rather than the offensive side. So when someone comes into Kaspersky as a virus analyst, as a researcher, they go through an extensive period where they're doing kind of the um, crate signatures and other things as well, but they, they learn the basis of how to do the defensive, not the offensive. So th there's a difference there, I think. And I know things when you talk about ethical hacking, um, it may sound interesting for someone who's a, going to be a, a, a security officer at a company and you can get them to come to your training course or come to your career project or your uh, master's course. It might be interesting for them, it sounds more interesting for them. But um, that's from a, like a marketing point of view. If you do it properly, I think you create a program which is more defensive rather than offensive. From my perspective, that's much, much better. I, I, I agree with you, but I guess from an educational provider's perspective, you know, we are seeing also an increasing demand actually for specialists 
inoffensive. You know, there's the defence contractors, there's the likes of the NSA, GCHQ, so on and so forth. You actually require these, these students to have the knowledge and skills to be able to do this. And I guess, you know, you know our programmes are created defensively and we aim for a different segment of the market. But I guess there is a question to be answered, you know, do some institutions need to think about this? So, I mean, it's essentially, uh, they, well, they claim that it's a two-fold intent of increasing awareness and you know, skill sets, so there's a competition in terms of defending it. So it's the same people who are defending it, and then, um, yes, by the pack it in. So, but it's interesting, and, uh, in a sense, it's a, it's a more hands-on, practical way of applying stuff that you know. It's, at least that's what, that's what they do. So, I think, you're right as well, I think, it depends what side of the fence you are on. Yes, but to create a challenge like that, and from their perspective, it's very good if they get people to try, and if it's set up in an environment like that, then for me, I can go, I can go with that because they're protecting, they want to protect their systems. So by people trying to attack it, then if there's any vulnerabilities in there and it's been exploited, then we can actually fix those vulnerabilities. About cryptography, you want encryption that's been around for quite a while, being tested, that everyone's been trying to break it, and if they can't break it, then it's actually proven. So that's kind of a different thing to what I was talking about, like teaching kind of offensive um, things. You, you need to have more, have an awareness of the techniques, but be more interested in the defensive side of things rather than the offensive. Uh, I think that the there are markets. There is a market for both things. Unfortunately, yes. It is. From one <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. This should be for instance here in Portugal, uh, in, in our military academy, uh, there is a program on uh, information warfare. So we learn that, uh, and I think that uh, from a point of view of someone uh, that will do okay ethical hacking, it is a tricky name, probably. Uh, a stupidest one would be ethical cracking because what we're talking about is not acting with cracking indeed. Uh, but that, that's a, a term that is misused today. Um, but your your parallel with the a policeman does not know need to know how to break uh, for instance think it in a doctor from medical school. He, he doesn't need to know how a virus or a bacteria attacks, how, from where and so on. Uh, we are uh, trying to get defensive side without understanding the offensive side. Uh, there was a paper uh, in the Journal of Information Systems Security where an author was uh, somehow um, argued that we are um, walking to a scenario where the business information security defensive side is melting, is, is getting worse with the offensive side on the information warfare. So probably we really need to uh, teach our students how they do that efficiently, uh, with efficacy, effectiveness. Of course, that blind then we're going to be what are you going to do with those, with that knowledge? They will find also jobs for doing that. There are jobs for doing that, digital jobs for doing that. Of course, that there are the others, the critical ones. But uh, I don't see like uh, we should uh, just cut the, the access to the knowledge, to the offensive knowledge and offensive techniques and offensive tools and so on. That if we want to progress from a technical point of view, namely in terms of defense, we need to be very aware of the offensive. You uh, definitely defense. need to be aware of the offensive. And the first stage of being defensive, you need to know the techniques that they're employing to try and break into the systems. But what I mean is, um, they shouldn't then practice those kind of offensive techniques. They should know about how it's made, and but concentrate on the defensive side of it more than the offensive side. It's not. It's it's the difference between knowing about how something works and actually doing something the offensive. Okay, well, let's move us along um, from the university theme now to now to start to consider the wider context. So thank you for the for the panel on that theme. Thinking about organisations then, so what ought organisations to be doing to support awareness and education around security 
amongst their staff? And is there a gap between what they ought to be doing and what they actually are doing? And just as an example, I'll refer back to some results that were presented by one of the speakers yesterday, talking about password awareness and guidance. And they reported that from the thousand respondents they surveyed, only 22% of those respondents said that they were getting password guidance from their workplace. And almost certainly, all users within the workplace will be using password-based authentication. And so perhaps there, there's, a, there's an expectation that organisations ought to be doing more to promote the security that they need. So, is that the right question to ask? I mean, I thought... Well, I don't know. I thought the question <laughs> would be, the preferable question might have been, how can we, this group, and groups like it, remember, motivate or convince organisations to implement and maintain such programs? Program. This is a challenge for us. That, that's a relevant question to ask if we believe they're not doing enough already. So yeah. I think my question was relevant. I'd say your question's a bit of a no-brainer, particularly given our background, so I think we probably all agree that organisations should be doing more and they're not in the surveys or kind of provide the evidence to suggest they're not doing what they should be. So, no, I, you know, I, I think I would agree with that. Oh, sorry, Steve. So, sorry. I'll remember you. <laughs> yeah, so what, uh, that, we should toss that around, I think. You know, marketing campaigns, or of course, what's been tried in the past has been you know, media hype, hasn't it? And of course, they get blase about media hype eventually. It won't happen to me. And so, we need, I don't know, I don't know the answer, but I don't think there's a silver bullet somehow. There's no silver bullet, but uh, again, I'm from a security company, so in the UK, everything is about security. Everyone that comes on board, doesn't matter who, it, who they are, will go through an induction, so we do like a malware essentials and go through what our business is and safe practices. But that's just the first step. Um, security is a process, it's not a one-off training session. It has to be a process that is ongoing all the time. And for example, we, we now run like a social media, so it had to be safe on Facebook, privacy concerns, and passwords too, but it's not just doing it in a theoretical. It has to be applied to their real world, their job. So we put it, um, uh, make sure that they uh, practice kind of safe computing and why that they have strong passwords so we get them to, to actually play around with things like that to make it relevant to them. Because if you don't make it relevant to someone, then as soon as they get out of the, the session, the awareness session, that's it. They will forget it. But if they can put it to use straight away and know why they're using different parcels for different systems and things like that and um, get the buy-in from them, then it will actually become part of their mindset. And that's what we need to do, raise security awareness, not tra do training. Because training is the wrong thing. You can train someone to do PowerPoint slides, but you can't actually get them to be trained to be more secure. That comes from the mindset change. Give another analogy, it's like if you go on a diet, that's a short term thing and after the diet you just go back to eating burgers and fizzy pop and what have you. It, what it requires is lifestyle change and to become healthier and that's what we need to do with the um, security. So I think one thing tends to need to follow the other, so yeah, you need to begin with awareness raising to get it on the agenda but there still needs to be, in many cases I think some level of training for users, for staff, so they're actually able to cope with the security mechanisms and procedures that then they're aware that they need to be using. So I think there is a place for, for different levels of it. And just to, well, maybe rephrasing some of the question and, uh, and just to give a, a bit of a supporting statistic from a recent survey in the UK, we recently had released over there the Information Security Breaches Survey for 2013, and amongst the, the results there it was reported that 42% of large organisations still don't provide any security awareness or training for their staff. And yet there's tangible evidence in the same survey, as was mentioned, others that have preceded it, that those organisations that have security training tend to do far better in terms of then avoiding security breaches. So what do you think the barriers might be to organisations actually tackling this, given that there's clear evidence that they ought to? Yeah, that kind of uh, bridges your position and your position as well. Um, we did an experiment in the Cambridge and Virginia uh, about a year ago uh, where a doctor was assigned and we, we 
I will all summarize it. I'm going to go over the detail. But we we have uh, four groups of uh, ten managers each, all dealing with security, and and we took them into separate rooms at different times, and we gave them training on security awareness. Um, one group was given extreme technical training of you know, configuring firewalls to work not. The second group was given training in um, social issues, business policy issues. The third group, we mixed the two. So these were video based training, so we had created these 25 minute videos followed uh, by a lecture. And the fourth was our control group, and we gave uh, some credit. Sexual harassment training, so which had nothing to do with security. So these four groups were given, and then based on these four groups, we put them into creating a security policy. So you can now go and create a security policy for your own company. And then there was a whole test and assessment done. So the upshot of the whole experiment was that guess what? The people who had the right kind of work, social and technical mixed training performed the best in the outcome. Uh, people who had extreme technical training did not do very well. In fact, social training, and obviously, uh, the fourth group was all over the place. So, I think the message that we got out of this whole thing was that it's not just training, it's what kind of training. It's not the form of training, it's the content of training which has a profound impact on how policies are created, how security is managed in an organization. And I think, in my mind, unfortunately, do not spend too much time on what goes into a training program. And it's an afterthought at best. It's a, it's a box ticking exercise a lot of the time. It's box ticking. It's box ticking. We, we've trained this person. Okay. But until we actually figure that out properly, you might as well not know that. I think you're right, there's a great danger that organisations are just doing it to be able to show that they are <laughs> compliant with what they need to be compliant with and not actually caring about the underlying issue of ensuring the understanding yeah. of the target of the uh, I have uh, several examples from the regional companies that uh, have done training with some of the part of the company and they have stopped targeting uh, attacks from uh, by email and so on. Mm -hmm. So a, di a direct illustration of effectiveness of yes, yes. Was the training uh, social or technical as well? Uh, it was mostly, uh, I think it was e-learning and mostly social. So, so it was, you know, the same social effects, social engineering effects. Oh, it was uh, email effects, okay, so phishing. Yeah, phishing. And uh, where is this, uh, yeah, the training is, and it was effective. I think mean, historically, you know, one of the barriers might have been kind of the, the willingness that the employee to participate. And but some research we've done recently is suggesting that might be changing. And I think that's probably because as a member of the general public, we actually are using technology now at our home space a lot more. So we're more, <coughs> more aware of it. And actually, the research we tend to find was, you know, the organizations are not providing it, but we want it. So there's actually a willingness to actually participate in these programs and the organization simply won't run it. So I don't think we're necessarily, we being the general public or the employee, is necessarily a barrier anymore. But I think what's taught needs to be relevant to both the work and also possibly the home environment in order to maximize the opportunity for the, the benefits to the individual taking the course. I think you might find a greater level of acceptance amongst the, the target users then that they feel they're getting a benefit yes. for something that is for their personal life as well as for their work on it. Just before we move on to um, the why you're joking, okay, we'll have some more questions. I just have one comment and I have one inspiration for you. Uh, because uh, in the USA they have a uh, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month mm -hmm. for this is the 10th uh, year. Uh, in Norway we started uh, three years ago, so this is the function. In, uh, in the EU it's a political decision that in 2014 it's a month for everyone. So I will uh, challenge you all to, to start a uh, national cybersecurity awareness month in your country. Um, well, I think it's, it's already been running in the US, isn't it? The US is running. We, we, yes. we've been having, so we, we've had different levels. We've got, yeah, yeah. we've got a month, and then in my university, we have a day 
the quarter of month, you know, the October is typically the cybersecurity month, right? So then we have the permit. So in the UK we have Get Safe Online Week, for example, which takes place in October as well. Just before we move on to that wider context of the public awareness work, I want to just pick up one other thing relating to organisations. And this relates, we've been talking about the, the general staff, user, employee population, but what about the security specialists within organisations? Do you think the organisations have enough awareness about the specific security training certifications that they could usefully provide for their staff? And do you think those certifications are targeting the right sort of things? If any companies placing contractors with the government, they have an easy access to certified. Uh, you know, that's what they've got. Mm -hmm. you know, is it relevant, useful? Yeah, I guess you acknowledge it. But I think you partly answered the question. You know, the extent to you know, CISSP being the appropriate qualification you have throughout the whole of the federate in the government it seems a bit odd. You know, if you're a forensics expert, CISSP really isn't a relevant qualification you have whatsoever. Yeah. So there is a mismatch and misunderstanding to you. Okay, I can just badge myself as a screw professional and that's okay, that's sufficient. That's a misunderstanding actually of the, the, the level and depth of that knowledge that's required. Um, but I think things are getting better. You know, I think we, we did a paper a few years ago and this is the Capos and you used to see a lot of job postings where CITSP was required and it didn't really wasn't really required. It wasn't a management level position, it was a high technical position in instant management and forensics. So it wasn't the most appropriate qualification to have. That's what they labelled it as. Um, more recently, when I've been looking around at jobs, you start to see the, the GI qualifications coming up, and people are kind of more kind of a great deal of degree of recognition for these more precise qualifications that fit a particular niche in the market space. I think you're right. I think I think what I have observed over the years, at least in, in the US context, is it's a comparative field. You know, if, if a particular student or an individual goes out on the marketplace and says, you know, I have an MS and it's cybersecurity. Sure, that carries some weight. But then you have another candidate who look, he's, he's a lack of an MS in cybersecurity, plus I have a CISSP, plus I have this, plus I have that. You know, um, that person who stands out more than this individual. So I mean, it's a bit of a lack of you know, for certification. So you, you just, just collect and collect <laughs> and because, because you have a higher chance of getting a job. Okay, let's move on then to the final thing. Thank you for that bit. Um, about the, the issue of security awareness for the general public, which was a, a question to which I suspect I might know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Are we approaching the point where, in order to basically operate safely online, it's going to become unavoidable for members of the general public to have at least some baseline knowledge of security threats and the appropriate safeguards that they need to be taking? It has to go to the schools. Uh, you know, I think safe online behavior has to be uh, included in, in, in the middle and high school curriculum, uh, which in some instances it is happening in my, my, my some school they have done that successfully, but I'm sure other places it has been the same. Because you need to give that awareness and training and education at that level and mm -hmm. go with it. Uh, we can't expect them to behave responsibly in the online setting. But it's not only just the children, it needs to be the parents and the teachers. Uh, the children are normally more savvy with uh, technology, but they don't uh, recognize uh, how to be safe online. They don't have an appreciation of it. Uh, so it, we teach children to, uh, in the offline world, uh, common sense, you know, when you're standing at the, at the road, look both ways before you cross the road. So, what is a parent to tell uh, their child when they go surfing on the internet? They don't know what to tell them. There's no online common sense. And that's what we need to get across, this kind of online common sense of what to do when you're online, what's not good to do. And I think it's a difficult thing, and uh, it's the responsibility of people te teaching in this field, the responsibility of companies like ours as well, to try and get information across and awareness across. And we're not doing a good enough job yet. Yeah, we're not. I'll give you a really small example, and then we can take a question. I think the 
Um, let me go back to my son's school. Um, and I want to illustrate the use of acceptable use policies. They have a policy that uh, you can only go on to certain online sites and the supermarket, and if they're not those sites, they're still the supermarket. My son is a big soccer fan, a football. <laughs> um, and they were talking about some that we wanted to go to gold.com and check the score. And this is the dream during his recess time. He went there, there. And as a result, he gets a big man. Right? Because he's not supposed to do that. That's not acceptable news of technology at that point in time. And then I was talking with Mario the other day. He says, well, of course, you were very good. You know, the professor asking the student, the teacher asking the student, what's the score? Right? You know, I think it depends where you are and how you inculcate that. But I think for me, from my son's perspective, I think that's a wonderful lesson in the second of the news. Right? You want to be married, you should have gone to the Raising awareness. I'm 
particularly want to pose a question around service providers, so for example, social network services, a particular bugbear of mine when I look at some of these sites that require you to create an online account, typically password-based, is that they don't provide very much in terms of a barrier to entry to that site. They don't force you to look at password guidance. They very often don't provide effective password meters, for example. So you can quite narrowly choose a fairly weak password for those sites, and you could then potentially adopt that practice more widely for other sites you use. They say, OK, it worked and was acceptable there, and that's a leading site. Surely they would have my interests at heart. And then you, you start to perpetuate weak, bad security practice more widely. So it ought there to be an onus on service providers to meet the baseline level of good practice in terms of those sorts of things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can draw an example, you know, we did a, a, did a survey a couple of years ago of mobile phone users, it's it it kind of relevant in the space, and we asked them basically with mobile phones, what would they like in terms of security controls? And a large proportion, I think up of 80% of these 300 users basically said they want the security software and loaded on by default onto the device and enabled by, by, by device, enabled by default. So they're asking the manufacturer or the ISP or the, the mobile phone provider basically to actually provide all this stuff for them. And they were willing to use it all, or at least they suggested they were in this part of the survey. Another part of the survey, they didn't actually use what was there. So there's kind of a contradiction. But Fundamentally, they were looking for these technologies, and yes, if, if the manufacturers and the, the providers were providing it to them, they would, they would use it. Um, so I, think I, I think I read that paper of yours, the two of your own papers, to say that most people said yes, it's a really good idea for but yeah, I don't use it. Yes, so anyway, this paper is actually an extension of that one, but yeah, that was yeah, an earlier study. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, what they were saying. Don't be dare not put the pin there, but I'll decide to what they were saying was they wanted security, but they, they then seemed to be saying, okay, we're not using the mechanism that's there. So what we were taking out to be based on their other responses as well was more of a rejection of the current way in which security yeah. was provided to them, not that they were directly contradicting them yeah. themselves. Yeah, no, they no, wanted I, I that, but, yeah. but not that method. Uh -huh. What you have to think about is the motivation of these social network providers and other mm. providers. What they want is as many people on their website yeah. as possible. Actually, they can do and if you have a barrier mm -hmm. for them to get onto the system, then people might not bother. Mm -hmm. If you make it too difficult, but they have to make a password that's 12 digits long and it has to be uppercase, lowercase, special characters, and people might not bother. I'm not going to remember this. And no, no, they'll just, they'll they'll just do that, but they'll remember it in their browser. But they won't go on the website, and, but uh, these social networking need as many yeah. people as possible, and it's free. You don't pay to go on Facebook or on Twitter or anything like that. They make money, they monetize by having so many people on there which they can profile and then sell to advertisers. Mm -hmm. That's how they make them. So it clearly it isn't in their interest to have the security, so no. all there to be some. I wouldn't want to say regulation, but some expect, wider expectation that they ought to nonetheless meet the baseline to do it. it. It is from us as consumers of these social network sites to demand this privacy. And it has worked in some ways. I mean, we're beginning to see the backlash in terms of privacy, it, for example, absolutely. but not more generally the expectation that the accounts are protected in the first place. I think we, there's, a, there's a paper at some point where we basically regularly checked out the thing the privacy control, security controls, and as they've done, they took away privacy security as a default. They were almost using it as a way to get more information by making it more confusing, more options, more choices, because you don't have an understanding in the first place. It doesn't, if you have all the options, you're not making the decision, which is a, as you can log people into having all that power and still get what you want, get more than what you want, whereas it's very, very, very simple, then the company doesn't get as much information. But the, the design of these social networking sites like Facebook is, it's their design to share information go to these sites to share information chiefly with your friends and your family. But from, from Facebook's perspective, they want to then be able to use that to promote. If you like skydiving, for example, you go to the skydiving category. If you like a particular hair product, you will go to a particular category and then they will um, group you all together and then sell this say, hey, we have 50,000 people that like skydiving. If you sell your skydiving product here, or your hair product here, then you know it will cost this much, and it's a very targeted um, advertising. If you 
want now privacy and to lock down for people not to be able to get that kind of information, it's not good for their model. The model has to change. And it might be to pay for a service that has the extra security, has the extra privacy. But who here is willing to pay for this? I think we've gone past that. I'm not sure whether we can go back to it. Well, I'd like to have tried this one and then I started with the app dot net we tried the whole you pay for like I thought it was like a Twitter account of you pay so much money a year and they've already sort of put a thing to a sort of freemium model. As consumers we're not prepared to do that. So mm -hmm. it's partly our responsibility as well. Yeah, yeah, I think it is that thing about people need to see the value proposition yeah. paying or doing something more in order to get protection in other kinds of things they say they want and they've got to be able to accept the effort. But it's also a wider in a risk perspective because I, I think people on Facebook might actually recognize their information as personal, but Facebook don't care about that. Whereas, for instance, if they use the example of banks, the banks have more recently recognized actually the value of the information and if those accounts are misused actually the fall into coming back to cost their money. So we've seen two token, uh, two factor authentication tokens all coming in. There's a liability. Yes, exactly. So if we're able to introduce that liability to Facebook for some reason, i.e. make them liable for loss of our information or something, that might then force them to think about controls that are more appropriate. Okay, now on that note, folks, I think we've reached the end of our time slot, so I would like to say thank you very much to the panel.